This is Afes al Azhar. In 1971, he got the Syrian presidency after a successful coup d'etat until 2000, during which his son Bashar al Assad took charge of the country. After that, the country started a period in which many demanded political, legal, and economic reforms, but it ended with the government arresting well known activists. This was known as the Damascus Spring. In 2012, the UN Security Council resolution condemning action against Syria is not adopted after a veto from China and Russia. From this point, countries such as France and Great Britain started to question the role of the UN, mainly because of its inaction in the conflict. After that, Barack Obama authorizes the CIA to collaborate with Syrian rebel troops. Here is where the U.S. started to be indirectly involved in the conflict. In 2013, the U.N. released a report that confirms the use of chemical weapons in an attack on civilians on August 21st. In October, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons announces that Syria has destroyed all its declared chemical weapons, mixing, filling, and production facilities. In 2014, were held the first multi-candidate election since 1947, in which al-Assad was re-elected receiving 88.7% of the vote. These were also the first elections since the civil war broke out in 2011. In 2015, Russia carried out its first airstrikes in Syria, claiming ISIS was the target, but anti-Assad rebels were attacked and overwhelmingly affected. The U.S. was helping the rebels, remember? Here Russia was attacking them. Can we see this as an indirect attack from Russia to the U.S.? Also this year, Assad's regime used chlorine gas as part of an attack. The U.S. Secretary of State, Jim Kerry, calls for an investigation into the allegations. In February 2016, the U.N. Security Council reached a deal for a temporary cessation of facilities, where some organizations were allowed to access certain territories in order to assist civilians. Later, at the end of the year, Syria's state-run media announces that the government forces have taken full control of Aleppo, ending more than four years of rebel rule there. It is clear this conflict escalated to unthinkable proportions. To get a grasp of this, let's talk numbers. The problem is that there is no consensus or exact number about how many deaths the conflict has provoked, nor how, about how many people have been displaced or the exact distribution of refugees in other countries. By 2014, the UN had calculated 400,000 had died while the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights had stated the cipher was 312,000. According to the UN refugee agencies, there were 6.6 .6 million people displaced within the country's borders by July 2015, and 4 million seeking shelter outside. There are 5 million Syrian refugees in neighboring states. This represents one of the biggest refugee crises in modern times. Besides, it is estimated that 6,000 people flee the country every day. So, what are your interests in my country? Iraq has been in conflict for years. Insurgency and violence between the different Islamic groups have intensified since 2011, after the Second Gulf War. The Syrian government was believed to have a blind eye to the insurgents and weapons flowing from its borders into Iraq. Now, tables have turned, and ISIS terrorists took advantage of the civil Syrian war to enter the country intensifying the conflict. Turkey. Relations between Syria and Turkey have been difficult for over 20 years for several reasons. The violent response from the Syrian government to the Syrian Spring made Turkey, along with Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the US, and the EU, support and train the anti-government rebels in Syria. Israel tried to maintain neutrality, keeping its borders safe and limiting the influx of refugees into its territory, but its position went clear in 2016 when Israel Prime Minister admitted they would operate when necessary with no fear to attack the Syrian territory, carrying out deterrence activities, seeking the other side to understand they don't want to fuck with them. The present situation I'm actually living has to be deeply analyzed. Countries like Bulgaria and Hungary are not enthusiastic about welcoming refugees to the point they have decided to build border fences as happened with Turkey. On the other side, Germany is leading the pro-refugees movement, stating that I have the duty of helping Syria and its inhabitants. Additionally, we have to acknowledge that some politicians have used this current situation to gain votes promising to break out with me to enhance the domestic situation as has happened to France, to Netherlands, and Germany. My intentions in Syria can be seen from two perspectives. One, which is the one I have stated, refers to the UN and its duty to comply with its purposes. More specifically, 
purpose number seven, which argues that no action taken by the organization shall overstep a state sovereignty. On the other hand, in a more realistic view, it is in my best interest that the Syrian regime continues the same way, or ever more, to prevent Western influence in the region. This way, I can ensure that Iran retains its regional support and that it will not fall prey to another Western-led invasion due to its alliance with Syria. I started my participation in the conflict by rejecting the regime's measures and repeated violations of human rights. I support the, re the regime's main opposition alliance, the National Coalition, and provide military assistance and training to moderate rebels. Nonetheless, I have stayed clear of confronting al-Assad directly or intervening through ground forces. I have focused more on the war on terror and therefore have deployed several airstrikes on IS and other jihadist groups since September 2014. The conflict has the potential to create more negative spillover effects over key allies in the region, like Jordan, Iraq, Israel, and especially Turkey. Refugee flows and refugee camps have the potential of recruiting more terrorists, and at the same time, it's threatening European unity. The risk of regional contagion is just too high. I am back in the Syrian government too. First, protect my interest in Syria. Since Soviet times, I have had a naval facility in Tartus, which is my only getaway to the Mediterranean. I also maintain forces at an air base in Latakia. Second, preserve a strategic influence in the Middle East. The death of Hussein and Gaddafi deprived me from key allies in the region. I can't just let go of Syria too. Third, fight Islamists. I fear that an ISIS victory would start to replicate at home. Fourth, to maintain and increase my Christian support at home. With an economic pain caused mainly by international sanctions, I need a distraction to rally support and boosting national pride. Fifth, marketing. I am an arms seller. What better stand to market your own products than a foreign civil war? Turkey, Russia and Iran presided a round of peace talks in Astana, Kazakhstan. Even with the assistance of fighters representing the opposition, Russia showed to be more engaged in solving the conflict through diplomatic means. The U.S. only attended as an observer. It is curious to see that initially Russia entered the war by stating that it was going to fight terrorists but has been accused of attacking rebel positions instead. It was made clear in February that Iran is openly cooperating with Russia under the same premise by lending its airspace to the Russian aircraft to execute air raids and as well as for Julie providing financial, political and military backing to President Bashar al-Assad. An important event to remark is the Battle for al baq that took place from November 2016 until February 23, 2017. This battle not only represented eliminating Syria and Turkey IS border crossing, but also preventing the unification of territory controlled by the Kurds. This battle posed a recurrent dilemma for the US. Should I support Turkey and the Free Syrian Army or the Kurds? Both are my pals, but how can I choose without hurting current strategic alliances? At the end, Turkey-led forces were the heroes of the day. However, this was not a victimless battle, as over 60 civilians and rebel fighters were killed by a car bomb in Susian village on February 24th. A new UN resolution about imposing sanctions on the Syrian government for the use of chemical weapons was drafted, and Russia exerted its veto power on this proposal by stating it was totally inappropriate. The draft would have banned the sale or supply of helicopters to the Syrian government, since an investigation conducted by the UN and the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons concluded that helicopters were used to drop barrel bombs containing chlorine gas. Guess who vetoed the resolution as well? China. Interest people, interests. In April, the US is striking the Syrian government's airfield follow its objective of punishing the use of chemical weapons. According to the US ambassador to the UN, we have to acknowledge that the US won't leave Syria until it has a leader who will protect its people, and certainly for the US, this leader won't be Bashar al-Assad. After our research, we may conclude that first, Syrian conflict has its origins in the deep internal divisions in the country's society, but it has escalated as a product of international intervention. Second, the geostrategic interests of the powers harden a short-term solution. Third, opposite to what the world expects, this kind of war has minimum consideration about the civil population rights, which at the end of the day are the ones that suffer the real consequences of the war. Fourth, the Syrian war makes evident the manipulation of information by all the actors, which transforms the facts according to their own interests. Fifth, the Syrian war is an interesting case to review the political viability of lay states in Muslim societies.